And if I were to say to you, which I did, when we think of the persecution of the church, immediately our mind thinks of the Roman persecution. If you study that, the, they say there was 10 organized persecutions of the church under Rome, starting with what man? Nero. And we're talking organized Roman persecutions. We know the Jews early on persecuted the Christians. So James says to the 12 tribes, which are scattered abroad, that scattering was a result of persecution. And God often will use persecution for the propagation of the gospel. But it's going to start with Nero and go from Nero to uh, the emperor Diocletian at the end of the 200s. And then we have the embrace of the church by Emperor Constantine. But it's interesting, that period of almost 200 years ended with the Roman emperor embracing the church and then a controversy which shook the church. And that was the Arian heresy settled at Nicaea in 325. And so what I want to do today is backtrack to our outline that we started with on Friday. And we said that we were looking at the changes, and we looked at some of those changes setting the stage. And then we, uh, in a sense, jumped over point two. I said I was going to come back to that. And we looked at the controversy within the Reformed Church. Now I want to go back to point two. And let's deal with the conflict in the Netherlands. But to do that, I would like to make a parallel dealing with a prepared time by God, dealing with the persecution of the church, not by Nero, but you're going to learn a modern Nero. Anybody want to guess what his name is? Philip. Philip II is going to be the modern Nero. And we're going to see a persecution of the church that the historian Edward, Edward Gibbon, who wrote the famous history on the Roman Empire, he said the Roman persecution would pale in comparison, oh, broad in its length, but the numbers of people put to death would pale in comparison to the numbers that were put to death in Holland during this time of persecution. We know it as the Spanish Inquisition. And we think of the Spanish Inquisition happening mainly in Spain. The rain stays in Spain, but uh, uh, it wasn't. The, the fury of the Spanish Inquisition is going to be in Holland. And that's where you see the subpoint up there. It's going to be the Spanish Habsburgs that in the providence of God is going to set the stage for that persecution that's going to lead to purity, that's going to lead to propagation. And the next century, we're dealing mainly with the 1500s. And if you see previously, we're looking at the beginning of the 1600s. In a sense, I see a parallel with the Nicene Council and Creed with the Synod of Dort. And so what I'd like to do is just to walk through, and, and you know, we can study the facts of history, but if we can't look at what God is doing, and, and God's looking down, and you know, a thousand years is this a day, and a day is a thousand years, and, and, and he's orchestrating, and we don't always see his hand. But I want us to step back and look at some of these. I, yes, there's the danger of being oversimplistic. But that overview shows us what God is doing. And there's so much in Galatians 4.4. But when the fullness of time was come, it doesn't nuance all that. But oh, there's a beauty of study as we examine what God has done on the pages of history. Again, this morning, on a spur of the moment, I was thinking of this theme. And I thought of this idea of persecution. When you think of persecution, 
who is the man that you think of that documented the persecution of the church? Fox, and what did he write? Book of Martyrs. You know when he wrote it? Excuse me, you know when he published it. I don't know where, when he started it or how long he worked on it. But it was published in 1563 in the midst of a terrible persecution in Holland. I like to connect dots. This morning when I thought of that, I thought of something in my office, which my father gave me. And then that started me thinking about my father. Many of you know my father, knew my father. I wasn't going to do this, but it was three years ago today that I was sitting in this church following his funeral. And I thought it would be fitting for me to honor my father, who had a love for history, who had a love for God's word. And through God's providence in his life, and I'm not exaggerating, I think many of you would agree to this, had one of the best collections of first edition English Bibles in the country. And there's all sorts of circumstances of how that took place. And my dad would go around and he would uh, take those Bibles, wrap them up, put them in the trunk of his big Lincoln, and he'd travel the country giving lectures on the history of the English Bible, but he wanted to do more than that. He would set up tables, and he would encourage people to come up and handle century-old Bibles to know that God's word is sure. God's word has been handed down to us. Years ago, as he dealt with a man in London the man said, I have a prized treasure you might want. And my dad bought it and gave it to me. Now this is not a Bible. But this is from the 1700s. It's Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, there are many editions of... Fox's Book of Martyrs, originally in 1763, there's just about three or four pages that talk about the time period and talk about the persecution in Holland because he was living, the, the horrors of it had not always all been revealed at that time. There have been later updates of this. So, in my dad's tradition, after Sunday school, before church starts, and uh, after church, I'll be in the book room, and I want you to handle uh, something that came out of the era that we're studying. So let's look at this topic again, and we're going to deal with the conflict in the Netherlands. But again, I want to go back and deal with these changes. We looked at those changes in shaping for the Synod of Dort, I want to look, go back and look at it a different way as we hone in to what we know today as the Netherlands or Hollands. At this time, it was called the Low Countries, and see the situation that is going to lead to this conflict. And could I suggest, as we see the preparation that involved persecution, that led to purity, could I say that we are the fruit of the propagation that came out of that period, both in our Reformed tradition, but also for many of us in our American heritage. And that's what I want to develop, and knowing me and the time, we'll maybe take some of that and go into next week as well. So as we look at this change, could I suggest that change again was from 
the institutions of the medieval period. We're going to see a breakdown of that medieval church. We're going to see a breakdown of the monopoly of that medieval church. We're going to see the breakdown of feudalism, which was the government of much of Western Europe. We're going to see a breakdown of the social structure that really bound people to the land, bound people to feudal obligations. I'm here today, my family, I am the ninth generation uh, in this new land. My great, 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 great grandfather by the name of Adam Fisher was trying to get some food for his family and he killed a deer in a forest, as the story goes, and I'm not trying to be Elizabeth Warren making up stories, uh, but as the family history goes, he was caught, he did not know, but they said that he was caught poaching on the Lord of the Manor's forest. Well, the manor was vast, and nobody, but he wanted to feed his family. And he was caught. And they said, you have a choice. Go to jail or go to the new world. And since then, fishers have been eating well. <laughs> if you know my dad. But life on the manor, life of um, obligations, a life of self-sufficiency. All this is going to, in the fullness of time, start be broken, breaking down, and there's going to be some new forces at work. There's going to be the impact of new waves of, of influence on Western Europe that really is going to shape, shake uh, Western Europe and bring us into the modern era. It's a pivotal point in the swing of the gates of time. And as historians look at world history, we have ancient, medieval, and modern. The 1500s is the hinge that that's going to swing on. And we have powerful forces, broad forces, that are going to impact Western Europe, that is going to impact so much of the history of the world uh, since 1500. So it's this that I want us to look at this transition because if we don't understand the transition, we can't understand what's happening in, in the low countries at this time, leading to the conflict, which at the, out, at the end of that century is going to be the Synod of Dort, which we looked at Friday night. So my outline Friday night was some of the changes of the period, but I want us to focus into the 1500s, the changes of the century. We looked at this overall period as being a, 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 an age of dramatic change, but I want us to look at the century of dramatic change. It was a century of devastating conflict. We examined some of that, but you can go at the changes of the, this period, there was everything from the Hundred Years' War that ended in 1453 prior to this century. We're going to have the wars of religion. We're going to have ending in what I mentioned Friday night, the, uh, what is called the Thirty Years' War at the beginning of the 1600s, 1618 to 1648, which many believe was the first world war of Western Europe. So it's going to be an age of devastating conflict. Uh, we mentioned, and our focus Friday night was on the defining confessions. As it was in the days of the persecution of the early church, and out of that, the questioning, you know, a truth was assumed, the deity of Christ, and then that was challenged in the third, fourth century. The church gathered to clarify and enunciate the truth of our Savior. But I want us, in this conflict, there's going to be another emerging force, and that's going to be that of developing countries. And I know some of my colleagues in here who are in historians, when we speak of that word developing countries, we often refer it to the 1800s, and we, in the area of uh, European imperialism and some of the withdrawal from that, then it's the developing of some of the, what we call the third world nations. 
I'm not using that in that sense. The developing countries here we're going to be looking at is the beginning of what we call nation states. Feudalism was local. Feudalism, and, and, and I'm, I'm taking time here because we're going to elevate a champion for Holland and a champion for the Reformed faith, and that's going to be William the Silent. And you can't understand William the Silent unless you understand some of these feudal obligations because he was a feudal lord and he was also a feudal vassal. He owed allegiance to a lord. And he's going to want to honor that allegiance in the midst of this conflict. And that's going to be a struggle for him. But through the persecution we're going to see that it's going to refine his heart and have him take a stand for his people as a George Washington took a stand for the American colonist with the repression of Britain. So we're going to see William the Silent is going to stand, take a stand for the rights and privileges from feudal days for Holland and he's going to be the champion of a nation in the making that we know today as Holland. As we're going to see at this time, uh, the emergence of a nation state we call England and a nation state we call Scotland. Canada will come later. But, uh, and, and then, of course, they're going to merge in the United Kingdom, but that'll be another uh, century later. But these nation states, and when we think of Europe today, we think of the nation states, but you cannot think of it that way. There was no Germany. There was no Italy. There is becoming of Spain. There's a becoming of uh, England. And there's going to be the becoming of Holland. And that's going to be the setting. Now, I know I'm taking some time. But I want to lay that foundation because it's important that we see when the fullness of of time of God's providence. And God's providence isn't confined to just the incar incarnation of Christ. God is working out his purpose through all the ages as he's working out his purpose in our life. And we ought to take stock to take, take a look at what God is doing. So, Let's do a case study. You're going to help me this morning. All right? Again, a famous church historian and a famous historian that happens to be sitting in the back has taught me over the years that you look and you evaluate something by the acrostic Persia. P for, not Pinozian, but P for political. E, E, as he used to say, <laughs> economic, R for religious, S for social, I for intellectual, and A for aesthetic. And we're talking anything from art, architecture, things of that nature. And if we're going to take a century and look at these forces at work, Let's take the 20th century. A century. How many years? Are you there yet? And you look across this room. I see some that are just beginning the century of their life. And for some of us, we won't go there. <laughs> but as we do grow older, we look back and look at the changes we've seen in a century. My grandparents, my grandmother was born in 1883. Um, think of the changes in this country that she saw during her lifetime. Were those dramatic changes? Were those dramatic changes? And could I suggest 
The 1500s were just as dramatic. My grandfather, my dad's father, when he was in his 20s, ran the first phone lines to his city in central Indiana. What's a phone line? My grandfather was a, an inventor. He was a, he, he worked for the research division, Delco Remy for General Motors and many of the updates of our automobiles. He was in the division to help think of new gadgets. Now our cars have these built-in navigation and all that. He would have loved to see this. But I'm thinking of the early 20s that he went from bringing the first telephone line for the first phones to his community to in 100 years, less than 100 years, we have this, and what's a phone line? So, you help me. Let's walk through. And if we were to take this 1900 to two, and, and you know, there's nothing magical about dates. We sort of put them there. Uh, when we think of this 20th century, let, let's think of it politically. What, are, what, what, what would be some of the key events politically and we'll, we'll deal with the context of maybe the United States rather than the world. But if you deal with the United States, what would be some key events politically? Uh, and all the elements of government and governmental decisions and conflicts or whatever, what would you put on this timeline? The Great Depression. The Great Depression. Let me, would that better fit economic? Oh, but can you separate the economics and the political? What would be in the driver's seat? We said Friday night that these elements are all in the car. Political, economic, religious, social, intellectual, aesthetic. They're all in that car. But at any one time, one might be a driver. The others will be in the back seat. So who was driving the, the uh, depression? Probably the force of economics. And that's hard to separate, but we, again, we're being general here. So good, Pol political, what else? World War I and II. Did that, those have any impact on society? Oh. <laughs> now, see what I'm doing? I'm doing this purposely. Because if you have localism and you have in Holland, there's not a Holland, I'm gonna say the low countries, that's the geography. You have feudalism, but you have some lords who are over some, some, I'll call them estates, and they have authority over that. And now in this period, they're gonna be called provinces and they have a certain measure of freedom. They also have a certain measure of collectability that, collectability, collectivism, that's not the right word, Collaboration, that's what I want. Collaboration of what was called their House of Representatives. It was called an Estates General. And they meet together. Oh, I could think, I could think of the American colonies who get together. By the way, when they got together in the midst of a conflict with a, well, it wasn't a foreign governing authority called Britain called England at the time. And that governing authority, uh, they're going to declare their independence. Who gave them that right? But they represented the local colonies. And I want you to see that same concept is gonna be present as we're going to see this localism versus centralization. The centralization won't be a united government, but the centralization is going to be the Spanish king that says, I want to take over. And they're going to say, whoa, 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 whoa. We're not Spanish. What right do you have to take over? And we're going to look at that. Every right, but every wrong. All right, so world wars. And these world wars are going to shape politically the nature and authority of government. And that's going to be in our subject. What else politically? 
Watergate, so you could go through the whole history of the presidents of, so we start the century with um, uh, McKinley, and he's gonna, followed by Teddy Roosevelt, and we'll go all the way uh, through Bush ends the century, no, Clinton, excuse me, ends the century, and uh, we start the century with another Clinton. So, uh, not as president yet, um, but, <laughs> never mind. Uh, <laughs> we know that's being talked about today. Economically, we mentioned the Depression. What else economically? I'm not gonna labor this. Do you see where I'm going? Federal Reserve. Income taxes. Now, we've been told we need to pay, pay our income taxes. There's a purpose of government, and we have a responsibility to support our government. And could I suggest that goes back again to will, but not directly, but we're going to see William the Silent is going to support that. The concept of our relationship to government. What else economically? That's fine. Religiously. Go to some trial. That's early in the century. 1925. Ecumenical movement is going to be driving. And while that, you know, the driver's seat of that could be in Europe, we're going to see that the U.S., because of our world position, is going to be involved in that. Question. In your mind, and I, I'm, I'm, we're not going to take time if we wanted to, we could do this the whole time. But if you look at these forces, and you look at the 20th century, which one do you think was driving the car for the United States during the 20th century, and which ones were in the back seat? Was religion, is religion the back seat? All right, now, now really, think about this. What are the major religious events or focus or movements that you can talk about in the 20th century as compared to a previous century? Well, I'm speaking of, uh, yeah, excuse me, I'm thinking of uh, from an orthodox perspective. So in a sense, could we say we're in the back seat? We have been, where if you go in the early history of our country, were the Puritans in the back seat? No. And it says something. Now what I'm doing, I'm trying to build a concept of forces at work. Which of those are moving forces? You know, of late, just this thing, you would say intellectual, the, the technology um, is something that's driving. You could go back to the beginning prior to uh, the eight, uh, 1900s and you say the industrial revolution. And again, that would cross many of these lines. You could go to the age of the Renaissance and which one of these would be in the driver's seat? The aesthetic, the, aesthetic, the arts, the architecture. All right, I've spent a lot of time, but you get the point. The point is that there's powerful forces at work shaping a time period. And they'll, they'll be different from this day and that day. They're going to be different in the different, as, as uh, Mrs. Abrams said, the idea of, of the centralization of government and the power of government. You can really look at that in the midst of government's response to the depression and then the pattern that's going to set. And what we've been talking about is that these things impact the outlook of a people. Uh, I'm not getting anywhere fast. <laughs> so I need to, okay, move on. Um, I heard a general, one of our four-star, five-star generals, he had the equivalent, held the 
equivalent office of Dwight David Eisenhower in Europe. He was in charge of the European Command uh, just a few years ago. He made the statement, in America, um, during the time of World War II, one-fourth of our population was directly involved in the war effort. One-fourth of our population. He said today, and this was several years ago, one, a point zero three percent of our population is actively involved. And what he was making the point is, in the 40s and 50s and 60s, the generation surrounding the war, you had a command respect because so many people were involved in the army, in the military. And that command and control typified how much of society was run. Where today, that's not true. So you get to people of my generation, why don't they respect and show? That was built into the culture of that day. And our culture today is going to be moving out of the hippie yippie movement out of the 70s and 80s, and they're going to have a different mindset. So I'm saying there's an overview that's going to influence the outlook. So let's look at some of these forces at work. So coming to the forefront are going to be some powerful forces that are going to merge into this 1500s, the 16th century. And in a sense, you can say representative of the Renaissance, Michelangelo. Or the Reformation, you have Luther and, and Calvin, Luther being the first generation. You can have Christopher Columbus um, and the Age of Discovery. Um, could I suggest in this that in the Renaissance you see divine preparation? All the tools that made possible this, and I'm not talking about Fox's Book of Martyr, but the fact that I could hold a Bible in my hands, the fact that I could, by the way, when you look at this, see if you can read it. It's English. But uh, their S's are different. <laughs> their F's are different. Uh, but it's something I can read. It's not in Latin. What made that possible? The Renaissance. And you have this Reformation that is going to drive the, the uh, religious, but also be tied to the political. And this age of discovery, especially in our study, we're going to see is going to be very, uh, the tool God's going to use to help propagate the persecuted Christians of the Reformation literally to go around the world and share the gospel and to start, if you want to call it, little Europe's all over the world that God's going to bless and merge into Canada and the United States and we could go around the world. All right, have I made my point? All right. And then let's focus now and bring it how all these are going to come into the low countries, to Holland. We're going to see, yes, Holland was a center, an intellectual center. We have Erasmus, the prince of the humanists, the scholar of, of this Renaissance desire to um, go back to the classics. It's Erasmus Greek New Testament that's going to influence Luther. Uh, we have the champion of the Dutch uh, independence is going to be William the Silent. And then in our study as well, we're going to look at the propagation where, you know, had it not been for a, a, a conflict between England and Holland, and Holland lost, we could be, we could be all Kivenhovens, you know, instead of Smiths. Um, we could have more Dutch here than, uh, but, but it's going to Henry Hudson, who's going to be an Englishman that sails for Holland is going to found, uh, put the Dutch flag on many areas such as New Amsterdam, New York, 
uh, areas of Canada that will lay the foundation that plus he was looking for a northwest passageway to come out in the east where the Dutch are really going to centralize and the Dutch East Indies is going to make Holland the leader of the world economically in the early part of the 1600s and that's going to be fleshed out in the foundation in the 1500s. So you can't isolate this. But what I'm building the case is that all these things in God's providence is working out for God to do a mighty work for his people in spreading his truth literally around the world. So, let me quickly, let's take a look at this overview so you can understand the outlook. This overload, overview politically, at this time, the low countries were comprised of what we know today as the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. So that country, basically the colors that are there are the, those countries today. Uh, politically, this period in the 1500s was part of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, the Holy Roman Empire's base was primarily in what we know today as Germany and Italy, but we're going to see it's also going to have a large holding uh, in Spain, uh, not as the Holy Roman Emperor, but a joint governorship of leadership, and we'll talk about that in a minute. There were 17 provinces, localism, again, think of it, if you would, as American colonies. We had 13 American colonies. They're going to have provinces, and each is going to have a medieval feudal uh, ruler called a stadtholder, a uh, state holder, a state ruler, and they will meet together in a feudal organization, much like the English Parliament or the French Estates General or the Spanish Cortes. It's going to be called a States General or the States Assembly in Holland. Um, economically, this low country, because of the, its focus point of being near France, near Spain, near England. Uh, it's the, the good natural harbors. They are going to be a commercial center, an international trading center that is going to emerge and that's going to shape their outlook. Uh, religiously, they're going to be like most of Europe during this prior to the Reformation, bound by Catholicism. They're not going to have strong, what is called bishoprics, territory ruled by a bishop. When you think of the Holy Roman Empire, when they elected an emperor, there were always representatives of high church leaders and high state leaders in the diet that elected a German, or elected a Holy Roman Emperor. But there weren't these large landed estates of authority. Um, oh me, my wife's laughing at me. This says you have five minutes and I'm just getting started. <laughs> so Tim will have enough to talk about the next two weeks. Um, um, where was I? Um, the religious. So. In the day of the Reformation, there's not going to be a Luther, a Calvin, a Zwingli. Uh, there's not going to be a Cranmer. Uh, there's no big dominant name. But as our brother was saying yesterday morning, uh, there are faithful men that are going to stand and preach that make a difference. There was a circle of travel among the leaders, uh, among the people that embrace God's truth to want to share that. And they're going to travel in this area. And many of them come to the low countries. 
Luther's writings are going to come there. And so we're going to see the early seeds of Lutheranism in, the Hol in Holland. Uh, it's not going to spread to a large movement, but it's going to be there. And it's going to start impacting the lives. Then, then we know that, be, well, I'm going to shape the outlook, but the outlook is this area is going to be a peri uh, an, an area that's going to be known for uh, freedom and toleration. And some of the persecuted Protestants are going to go there. Some of the persecuted Anabaptists are going to go there during this period. Uh, the uh, followers of Simon Minos, the Mennonites, are going to take root at this time in Holland. Um, the, the Reformation, as it develops in France, the French Huguenots, are going to become persecuted, and many of them are going to flee to Holland. Again, Holland is a misnomer. It's not Holland yet, the Low Countries. And we're going to have a strong, especially in what is today Belgium, uh, in, in an area we think today a strong Catholic, but back in that time, again, all this is one. They're going to, the Huguenots are going to be there. And so we have the emergence of of the Reformation there, but not a strong dominant leader. Um, intellectually, or socially, we're going to see it's rural, landed uh, farms, it's going to wool trade. Um, we're going to see um, the, the painter Bruegel is going to paint these everyday scenes of, of Holland life. Uh, landed nobility, Skilled laborers, the middle class that are going to flee persecution in other lands, especially a century later, and wealthy merchants, not tied to the land, but have freedom because of the wealth they bring to the crown. Not their crown, but uh, someone who wants to govern them. Intellectually, this is a period of exchange of ideas, a period where Erasmus was the prince of the humanist. Uh, universities such as the University of Leiden, which will be very important in our debate, in, in the subject of the dispute at uh, uh, Dort, uh, will center in that controversy. And then aesthetically, you have their art and their architecture and beautiful homes, beautiful structures, the painting. Uh, Charlie was talking about uh, the pictures of the Dutch painters, uh, the, the, the merchants and the the, uh, the, the scholars and the robes that they were, and all that stereotyped in the painting that had come out of this period, like from Rembrandt and others. So how did that outlook, or excuse me, how did that overview of these factors impact their outlook? I have five more minutes? Five. I'll go quickly and we'll end with this. Um, could I say they had a humanistic outlook? Now careful, careful, don't think of secular humanism. We were talking about that earlier. But this idea of, of the Renaissance day, of wanting to share learning, wanting to know what took place before uh, from the ancient Greece and Rome. There's going to be Erasmus in the struggle between Protestant and Catholic. He's gonna recognize the abuses of Catholicism, but he's not going to want to break with Catholicism. There's going to be a recognition, but there's going to be a, so there's a sort of a pragmatism there. There's going to be sort of a tolerance there. Holland, because of the trade, is going to have this international, and when you deal with international, you're going to be exposed to new ideas and open to people of other cultures, and so there's going to be a spirit of, of um, internationalism and tolerance just because you're dealing with different people. There's going to be an enterprising outlook. The Dutch are going to be very enterprising. We're going to see how this whole concept of, of the Protestant work ethic is going to be lived out in them. They are going to uh, be known for their religious toleration and uh, for the concept of loving freedom. I, I see so much of the early history of, of the United States in the Dutch people at this time. And it's no accident in God's providence 
that the very year that uh, Arminius dies and this controversy of Dort flares up in 1609 was the very year that the pilgrims came to Holland before they came to the New World. And uh, Leiden, the university where all this sprung up, is the city where they dwell. And they're going to be actively involved in the controversy surrounding Dort. And as I mentioned the other night, their, um, their pastor, John Robinson, is going to attend and uh, uh, later be a very su strong supporter of what happened at Dort. Uh, on the side of the uh, canons of Dort. Um, all those things are, when we think of Holland, we think of all these atmospheres, but can I close with this? And I, I'm closing on a negative, but to me, it's something that I think illustrates the day. There's a lot of horror and persecution. There's a lot of unsettledness in change. I look at you young people, you may not understand us as well, but some of us older ones, we're sort of unsettled with what's, ever, what's happening in our country today. It's change, change often very fast. Change that in our mind maybe moving away from some of the moorings. That can be unsettling. Put yourself in that day, and you have now the persecution coming in. And we're talking persecution. They're coming in and wiping out towns. They're wiping out families. They're butchering children. By the way, part of this is caught Arminius. He's saying, how can a sovereign God allow the butchering of children? And are those children going to be in heaven? And this is going to be part of the struggle of his theology because it's what they're living with. And if our theology can't dictate what we're living in day in, day out, what good is our theology? But it caused him to question. And those questions are going to lead to a controversy we call Dort. But whether that day or the present day, people often want to change their circumstances. The grass is always greener on the other side. And so it is that in that day, there was a lesson that they taught to children. A lesson that would seem very for us today, but it was a great object lesson. We see it today as well as then. Let me close with this illustration. My wife and I this summer were in Amsterdam. And outside of Amsterdam is a stereotypic castle. Isn't that beautiful? So we toured, toured that castle just outside of Amsterdam. And while we were walking through, the, the tour guide was showing us around. My wife saw on the wall a painting. And she said, oh, that's, what is that? And so she asked the guide, and I'm glad you brought that up. Let me tell you about that. So here's, I'm not going to, I'll show you the painting in a minute, but I want to describe it first. There was the day that in the midst of difficult circumstances, and those circumstances could be in life or for me personally. Why did God make me this way? What can I do to change my circumstance? Can I have a do-over in golf? Can I have a mulligan? Did, did God make me right? Let's, let's, let's get this right. And so, as the storyline goes, that there was a certain bakery, a baker, in a small, low country town where you could go there and sit in what we would call barber chairs. And it was a bakery shop, and you would sit down, and you would say, could I have a do-over? Could you do over my, my face? 
could you do, you know, this is early cosmetic surgery. <laughs> and so what they would do is simply remove the head and put it on a, and place it into the oven and do a rebake. And then put it back on your head and you got a do over. And w while your head's in the oven, they would put a cabbage on top of your head. I don't know if that's why we had, let's call it a head of cabbage. I, I, I've, I've been looking to see if that's the origin, but it gives good, so you think about that every time you see a head of cabbage. Um, but the problem is, and we know this, God made us this way for a purpose. God controls our circumstances. And so the moral of an allegorical painting is, yeah, you can have your head rebaked, but you know what? It could come out and you could be a hothead. Or it could come out and you could be half baked. Or it could come out and they put it back on and it could be a misfit. And some of these expressions we use for, for um, not quite all there is just saying people who are discontent with their circumstances and say, hey, I think things are going to be better, it may not always turn out that way. Rather than let's trust in God's providence and God's circumstances for us. Now, you know, it's... It's very graphic. But the storyline, they use this to teach children. And I don't want to dwell on that, but I do want to dwell on the storyline that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. God's providence. I've taken a long time to set the situation. I want us to look at that actual events that took place in the 1500s that's going to shape a nation, that is going to influence the world, that's going to influence England and their Westminster Confession, their struggle for independence. And it's then going to influence the United States and our struggle for independence and influence many of the political documents that we know today are the founding of our, institution, of our country. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the lessons of history, but more importantly, Thank you that history gives us the opportunity to study thy working among the children of men. We pray that you'll give us hearts that will recognize thy dealing in our lives, be satisfied with thy providence in our lives, and be motivated to tell others of what you're doing in the working out thy kingdom in the affairs of men. So to that end, I pray that you might use this to give us a greater appreciation for the wonders of our great God, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen.